Welcome to Navigating Advocacy, the true crime podcast that goes beyond storytelling to ignite change and seek justice. I'm Melissa. And I'm Whitney. As true crime enthusiasts turned passionate advocates, we've seen the power of storytelling raise awareness about unsolved crimes and bring hope to victims and their families. We hope to inspire action and promote positive change within the true crime community. Our mission is simple. We provide a platform for victims and their families to share their stories, to be heard, and find solidarity. But we don't stop there. We offer practical guidance to our listeners on how they can actively make a difference in their own communities. In each episode, we'll discuss a different unsolved case. We'll examine the details, highlight potential leads, and strive to spark new interests that may help advance the investigation. Our goal is to reignite hope and ultimately bring justice where it's long overdue. But this podcast is about more than just a conversation. It's about building a community of like-minded individuals who share a common purpose, making a real difference in the fight for justice. Whether you're a seasoned true crime fan or new to the genre, we invite you to join us on this journey of discovery and advocacy. Together, we can create a wave of change. We're here to empower you to also become advocates for change, no matter where or who you are. We are Navigating Advocacy. We discuss topics that may be sensitive to listeners. Discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Whitney. And I'm Melissa. And this week, we are Navigating Advocacy in Ohio. Ohio is one of those states that have a lot of crazy things going on, just like Florida, Texas, and California. Today's episode is about the missing person case of Cynthia Anderson, but she didn't live in Ohio. However, every day she would make the short drive from her home in Michigan, where she lived with her parents, over the bridge into Toledo, Ohio for work. And this is where Cynthia, more commonly known as Cindy, vanished. What makes this disappearance so unusual is the various events that occurred in the months prior to Cindy going missing. Join us as we navigate through what is known about this 42-year-old cold case and get the community talking about Cynthia Anderson. Toledo is a fairly decent-sized city with around 270,000 people living there. It is nicknamed the Glass City because of all the glass manufacturing companies that were there at one time. Toledo has an impressive art and music scene. However, in 2018, the city was ranked 43rd in the top 100 most dangerous cities of America. Notable people from the area are the voice actors for Yogi Bear and Huckleberry Hound, a few Playboy Playmates, and actress Katie Holmes. I thought about saying ex-wife of Tom Cruise, but then I was like, she can hold her own without his name associated to hers. And she's worked so hard to disconnect from him. She really has. She definitely deserves it on her own. As I said before, this Ohio city has been ranked among some of the most dangerous places in America. It is rated a 5 out of 100 for safety on NeighborhoodScout.com. The violent crime rate is 2.5 times higher in Toledo than it is in the rest of Ohio. This state as a whole is less dangerous than the country's average, so that's good. Property crime is pretty high as well, but not nearly as bad as the violent crime rate. This is a very old cold case, so I think this is one of the reasons why I could not get into contact with any of Cindy's family, but I have read previous interviews with them over the years and have added some of the audio clips into today's episode. Cynthia Jane Anderson was born on February 4, 1961, to parents Margaret and Michael Anderson. She had three siblings, 
a sister, Christine, and two brothers, Mark and James. This was a close-knit Christian fundamentalist family. Cindy was described as a well-behaved and religious young woman. Her father's exact words about Cindy were, she was very quiet, obedient type of girl. She never made waves with either myself or her mother, and she had lots of friends. She was the type of daughter that you just enjoyed. I mean, just a beautiful young girl, end quote. Cindy had a boyfriend named Jeff, whom she met at church, and he was already in Bible college, and Cindy had actually planned on joining him shortly after she disappeared. And when I say shortly, I'm talking within two weeks after she dis. Oh, wow. Yes. So the plan had been made. She was going to move to the town and attend Bible college as well. But within about a week or two before this was all, this plan came to fruition, she vanished. Cindy had already put in her two weeks notice to her employer. She was a legal secretary there in Toledo. She had this small amount of time before she was about to get her first taste of freedom. She was moving out of her parents' house for the first time, into a different town. Like, she had, everything was about to start for her. A very exciting time in life, for sure. Yes. Cindy was excited about the future and had no signs or no plans of wanting to run away because she was literally already going. So her disappearance seemed so unreal to her family. In the months leading up to Cindy going missing, she started to have nightmares. These bad dreams were all about her getting abducted and then murdered. These were so concerning for her that she actually spoke to her mother about them. Her sister, Christine, overheard the conversation and stated in an interview years later, and I quote, I do believe that the dreams could have been a premonition of fears that Cindy actually had in her subconscious at the time, end quote. Once you hear about other details of her disappearance, it doesn't seem like a coincidence. And I'm not as this dreams always mean something type of person, but these were very concerning dreams or nightmares for Cindy at that time. Not only was Cindy experiencing these horrible nightmares, but she started to change her thinking about her appearance. And she would put herself on a very strict diet and she was skipping meals so that she could spend more time getting ready. She was putting extra care and attention into the way she looked, wearing more makeup. And this all happened in a few weeks before she went missing. Was this a 20-year-old young woman just trying to find herself? Was there a possible mystery man? Was she seeing someone else besides her boyfriend? And that is what um, attributed to her changing her looks. That's very a very suggestive thing. When someone suddenly changes their fashion sense, their you know need for a lot of makeup, someone is suggesting that. Yes, something's happening. And the fact that she was already a very thin girl, but now skipping meals and being on this ultra strict diet, something is going on in her life. You don't just automatically make those decisions or those choices like night and day almost. Yeah, those are very harsh. I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but it's very much... um, Like night and day. It's not a rash decision. Yes, exactly. Now, this could have been nothing. This could have just been Cindy. Like, she's realizing she's about to leave. She doesn't have to do exactly what her parents say. So she's, you know, experimenting with makeup. And possibly to her fundamentalist parents... It was big changes and, oh, my God, the amount of makeup. It could have literally just been adding on some mascara. I am not sure we will ever really know why Cindy was changing her appearance at that time. Another possible connection to her disappearance was the fact that someone was harassing or possibly stalking Cindy. She was receiving calls at her workplace there in Toledo that would leave her terrified. One particular example of this happened on August 3rd of 1981 
which is the day before she went missing. A client of the law office that Cindy had worked at was there conducting some business, paying his bill, that type of thing, when the office received a phone call. Cindy answers it and then hangs up very, very quickly. It rings again. She answers it. The client could tell she's visibly shaken by whatever the person is saying on the other end of the line. He can't hear anything on that. She doesn't say anything else, listens for a few moments before she hangs up the phone again. He can tell she's visibly shaken and she's very scared. He asks her about the call, but she just brushes him off, continues, you know, helping him pay his bill. But he was so concerned when he arrived back home, he called the police to make a report and asked the police if they could actually do a couple of drive-bys of the law office just to make sure Cindy was okay. I'm like, wow, "Wow, thanks for getting involved, guy, because that's awesome. Most people would not have done that. These calls were so frequent that her bosses at the law office, where she was a legal secretary, advised her to keep the doors locked at all times when she was in the office by herself. They also got her a panic button that she could press to alert the next door business. So if anything went wow. wrong. I mean, this is serious technology for back in the early 1980s. Yeah. So remember, this time frame is before the Star 69. But according to the New York Times, this feature was not widely introduced until 1992. So we're talking almost a, over a decade after Cindy goes missing. I could not determine if Cindy or anyone else besides this one client actually spoke to police about the harassing calls. There's no record if the bosses ever spoke to the police or if Cindy herself ever spoke to anyone about the actual calls. Other than Cindy being noticeably frightened, she did not tell others about the contents of the phone calls. She never said if it was male or female, what they said, if she recognized the voice. So even though these events were happening and people knew about him, it really didn't help police once Cindy actually went missing. They, there's no way that they could figure out who was behind these calls. Mm-hmm. A few more strange things that were happening in the months leading up was someone painted a huge I love you Cindy on the side of a building directly across from where Cindy would sit at the law office. So let me paint you a picture here. The law office where Cindy worked was in a shopping center. So there's very big windows right in front of the office and her desk was right behind the very big windows. So she's always like looking out into the parking lot, looking at the other businesses. Well, as she's looking out on the side of a business right in front of her, someone painted, I love you, Cindy, and then it was signed with the initials GW. So someone's definitely stalking her because they put it specifically, it's for her. It has to be for her. So that's what I would assume as well. But apparently Cindy was a common name back then. And I only read one report. Everywhere else, it was like, this was meant for this particular Cindy. One report said that a boyfriend had written it for his girlfriend that also worked in that same plaza. But I don't think that was ever, like, for sure, like, police checked into that to verify that that it was not for her. And I only found that in one spot. So this was put up about 10 months before Cindy went missing. Okay, and it was up for months before it was painted over. Okay, so I think it took about six months before it was painted over. Within a few weeks, it was back. And nobody, no, whoever did that did not come forward, even after Cindy going missing and everything. Nobody knew who really wrote this. It's so strange. Very. 
Very, very, very. I couldn't even imagine the amount of stress and terror this young woman was under. And I couldn't imagine sitting in that seat and seeing that after having these nightmares and having these disturbing phone calls, I would be terrified. Day after day seeing that? No way. Yes. Another thing that was going on in Toledo at this time was there were four murders in this area. But let's talk about the actual day that Cynthia vanished. She arrived to work at her normal time, around 8.30 a.m. She turned on the lights, the air conditioner, and the radio, just as she did every morning. She then laid the day's agenda on the two lawyers' desks, kind of whatever she did, her prep work in the morning. The lawyers are not there at this time. Cindy was known to read romance novels and paint her nails when work was slow after she finished everything. She's the only one in the building. Honestly, that pretty much just sums up every 20-year-old. They're doing something of that sort when they're bored at work. Yeah, there's no harm, no foul in that by any means. And the lawyers knew about this. They didn't have a problem with it. The office janitor saw Cindy at her desk around 9.30 a.m., And then some patrons that were passing by in that shopping center noticed Cindy through the window about 9.45 a.m. However, by 10 a.m., the office phone would go unanswered. So when people were calling in after 10 o'clock, nobody answered. Meaning sometime between most likely 9.45 and 10 a.m. is when Cindy would go missing. The lawyers would arrive around noon to a locked office door, but no Cindy. Typically, if Cindy had to go run an errand, pick up something, she would leave a note on the door for any potential clients that were coming by or for her bosses to kind of let them know where she was going. But today, there was nothing. No note. Two years ago, an Arizona couple told me that they were the victims of a sadistic cyber stalker. This guy put a threat out to our home. And he said, I'm in your neighborhood and I'm going to kill your family. I'm going to kill you. But detectives think that this family made the whole thing up. I get death threats about him wanting to go and blow my husband's head off quite often. And it rattles my nerves. I can't take it. I can't take this anymore. And then I get accused of having a split personality and maybe you're doing it and you don't realize it. I do not have a split personality. During the course of two years, I recruited an ethical hacker. I pulled case files, subpoenas, trying to figure out the identity of the perpetrator. Then one day, after handing over my episodes to the police, a grand jury issued an indictment for six felony charges. Things are not what they seem. Listen to the Stalker series on the Pretend Podcast. Find Pretend wherever you listen to podcasts. They knew that she was there because of the AC, the music, the lights, all of that was on. The The front door to the office was also locked. One of the lawyers smelled fingernail polish remover, and he noticed the romance novel opened up on her desk. So all of these signs points to Cindy being there in the morning. They also realized that the answering machine that Cindy would always put on if she did go run an errand, it was not turned on, which is something Cindy always made sure to enable before leaving. They waited a bit to see if she would turn up, but there were a few things that they just, they could not, they, they felt uneasy about. Definitely right away, they thought something may have happened. But just a few hours later, when Cindy hadn't shown back up, they decided to phone the police. Cindy's purse and keys were gone, but her car was still out in front of the office. Another disturbing possible piece of evidence found was that the romance novel that was flipped open, it was to the only scene in the book about a woman being abducted. This is something one of the lawyers noted specifically to police, which seems a bit weird because did they read the whole book and how did they know that it's the only spot with any violence? And if she was being abducted, why would she take the time to open it to that specific page? 
do they know that she was just quickly grabbed and taken out? Because if no one w- saw her from 945 until the luggage got there at noon, no one's saying that her captor didn't keep her inside the office for an extended period of time before taking her. Very true. There's zero signs of a struggle, so they do not know if someone took her. My thought is most likely these buildings and strip malls, they have two entrances. So you got the front one where the customers come in, then you have a back one. I know for sure that the front one was locked. I'm not, I couldn't find any information about if there even was a back door or if it was locked or not. So you would think if they came into the, in through the front, the person would have had to have the keys, but they could have honestly just taken Cindy's keys because they were probably in her purse to lock the doors back. Yeah, or they locked it from the inside and walked out the back door. Yes, if there is a back door. If 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 there yes. is a back door. And also, if it's someone that is stalking Cindy, because, I mean, the, if this message across the street is indeed for her, they would know likely know what book she's reading. Maybe the lawyer pointed it out because she had read the book before and knew that there was only one abduction scene in it. Like I feel like that, I don't know that you have to kind of harp too much on the fact that she knew that yes that it was open to that specific scene because maybe she just read the same book yeah well they're both guys both of the lawyers i know i think it's weird that he noticed that but it's reported a lot so i think there is some merit to it you know what i mean if if it's something Mm -hmm. that he noticed and police took the time to write down i feel like it could be something especially with everything else going on in cindy's life at that particular time If someone took her, I do believe that it was a person possibly stalking her that knows her, knows what she's doing day in and day out. Yes. Okay, the fact that there was no eyewitnesses made this this case difficult from the start. However, the time frame of her going missing is very, it's a short window, which is very good because that could help. Cindy was about to start her life. She was moving out of her parents' house and moving closer to her boyfriend. Not one person close to Cindy said she was having difficulties with life or wanted to leave it all behind. But of course, that's what, if a 20-year-old goes missing, that's what they go to automatically. If anyone goes missing, oh, they ran away. Mm -hmm. With the lack of evidence, the police didn't know what direction to go. But once they found out about the dreams, the harassing phone calls, and the graffiti, police grew concerned. Still, every possible lead dried up quickly. That is, until about a month after Cindy vanished, police received not only one, but two anonymous calls at the station. These calls came from a woman whispering, stating she knew where Cindy was taken and being held. The woman said that Cindy was in the basement of a white house, but then she quickly hung up after police tried to get more from her. She did call back. She said that the family owned two houses next to each other. She didn't have an address or couldn't give an address, but one family owned two properties, and one of the houses was white. She also told the police that the family was out of town at that time, but the son was the one that had Cindy. And he was at the property. So the White House is the one that apparently she was being held at, but the family owns two properties next to each other. And this is like all the information she knew or that she could give. And this was in Toledo? That's not narrowing it down much. Not at all. And I don't even believe that she said that it was in Toledo I think they took it as she was in Toledo because that's the police station she called, but I don't think they actually ever knew. I listened to a few reports of people trying to figure out how they could have possibly figured out. If this was a lead, how could they have found out? Two houses. I mean, is that something like, I I know you being in the housing industry, is that something you can go to records and be like, okay, can you give me all of the names of the families that own more than one house? Now there's probably a computer algorithm that could put it all together through tax rolls that could say, you know, as long as they're under the same name, Mm -hmm. you could find it fairly quickly. In fact, most tax rolls, you can find it from just a name alone. So probably. Yeah, you can um, filter it enough to get that. If you have a name. Yeah. 
but the the problem is that you have to have a name or yeah. a street address or something. It would be very difficult to find that information, let alone back in the eighties when Cindy went missing. Yeah, exactly. So that's all really that they got from that. And obviously, with that smidge of information, they cannot do much with it. They really took to the community to plead with this woman to call back and give them more information, but she never did. Was she a psychic or anything? I feel like that's something that a psychic would call in and say. She didn't say she was a psychic, but she was whispering and she sounded terrified as well that she was even making this call. So I'm not quite sure how she was related to any of it. Hmm. But that just goes to show you there's possibly people out there that know what happened. Yes. Cindy's bank account had quite a bit of money in it. She had been saving. She was just about to move out. But it was never touched. Her social security number would never be used in all of these years. Now for a few possible theories. I think the first one, which was the most coincidental, was which we didn't really even talk about this, was the janitor so of the office, okay? So the janitor has the initials GW, first of all. Okay. <laughs> okay. Lead with that. <laughs> yes. Um. All right. So that could be the person that painted the I Love You, Cindy, on the side of the building. This janitor also had a key to the building, Therefore, could and knew her exact moves, where she sat, what she would see, what book she was reading. Exactly, exactly. Um, he was checked out by police, of course, because they went through everyone, I believe, in the whole town that had the initials GW. Um, and I don't necessarily know if he was cleared because he didn't do it or if he was cleared because they didn't have any evidence. That said anything different. Okay. Um, so he did report. I mean, he is one of the last people that had seen her alive. All right. The next one was there was a serial killer. I should say killers roaming the streets around that time. The four deaths that happened to Toledo, there were two brothers that were convicted of those deaths. It was Anthony and Nathaniel Cook. This duo committed at least nine rapes and murders in the Toledo area during the time frame of 1973 to 1981. But honestly, looking through their victims, the victimology is all over the place, so it's not unheard of that Cindy could be one of their victims. They have denied um, having anything to do with Cindy's disappearance, though. Okay, the next one, and this is also, I think, a big one, that definitely could have something to do with it. And it's a bit confusing. It's like one of those that you need a chart because there's multiple players in this one. Okay, so one of the lawyers that Cindy worked for, his name was Richard Neller, okay? Well, before Cindy went missing, he had this client named Jose Rodriguez Jr. This guy was not on the up and up, to say the least. Jose was a drug trafficker, at the bare minimum. Jose was upset that his lawyer, Richard, because Richard didn't get him the deal that he wanted in one of his drug trafficking cases. So he fired his lawyer, kind of like there was a lot of tension, yelling, that kind of thing. This all happened before Cindy went missing. So you kind of think that would be the end of that, but no. This Jose guy was arrested again for drug trafficking in 1995. So this is years after Cindy's disappearance. But what does this have to do with Cindy? Well, a witness came forward and told authorities that Jose confessed to killing Cindy to get back at Richard, the lawyer, for not handling his drug case adequately. But to add on top of that, Richard, the lawyer, was arrested along with Jose for the drug trafficking in 1995, this lawyer was. So he just brought him on. So he was just like, hey, you just want in on the deal? How about that? Just come on in. Yes. So who knows if back before Cindy disappeared, if that even argument was even about Jose not getting the deal he wanted, or was it something to do with their drug trafficking business? Who knows? Are both of these lawyers in the office criminal defense attorneys? They are criminal defense attorneys. 
Well, I'm just thinking all any of the clients that may come in there, some of them may not be savory characters, you know? Exactly, exactly. So Richard and Jose, they went to jail for drug trafficking. There were rumors that Cindy overheard something she shouldn't have, and she was killed by this client to make sure she didn't talk. This is huge drug trafficking rings that we're talking about here. I guess I didn't realize that Ohio was like a main port for drug trafficking. Like, you know, you always talk about border towns of Texas, stuff like that. I guess you never really think about, I never really think about Really, anything that's not a border town? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But no, they being they come from Canada as well, some of the drugs. So, like, yep. it could have come from sure. that way. Th- I mean, that's a border, but... <laughs> yes. So, these two were in, in on something together at some point for them both to be arrested for drug trafficking. So, I mean, maybe Jose started to pull away from Richard and, like, that's... I, I don't know how all that went down, but that seems very, very shady for her to go missing from that type of establishment where there's some crap going on. Was Richard the lawyer that noticed the book? I believe he was. Hmm. This, So that's what I'm saying. I mean, and possibly could it be the lawyer and the janitor? Could this be a whole... Like, The whole law office could be a front for something as well. Who knows? So authorities did start looking into the validity of this witness and Jose's confession. But of course, they did not, they weren't able to get enough evidence to pursue anything. Now, of course, we have to add in the possibility that Cindy ran away on her own. Was the book being left open to a violent scene, the dreams she had, was this all an elaborate setup to look like she was being abducted? When in reality, she just wanted to start a new life. I don't think I could get on board with that because that's a lot of planning and prep work for a person that's already about to leave home. And to not take any money. Mine always comes back to the money. You need money to survive. So why would you not take, especially if you have a large amount of money saved up? Exactly. Why would you have not like siphoned that out in cash over these this transition period? Exactly. That she's going through. Yes. Into a cash and not just leave it sitting in a bank. Yeah, because you can pull out 20 bucks here, 20 bucks there. Nobody would know the difference. And then you have now a stockpile of cash instead of a stockpile of money in your bank. It's like anything under 10000 the IRS will never know. Exactly. Plus, I don't think she could have faked being that terrified about the phone call for the one guy to the client to actually call the police and make a report about it. So definitely do not think that that is a possibility. Yeah, like I said, she was about to go out on her own for the first time. I don't see her throwing all of that away to start a new life when she was already about to do that. Cindy's mother passed away just a few years after Cindy vanished. And then up until the day Cindy's father died, he was adamant that his phone number would not change and he would not leave the family home just in case Cindy came back one day. He often said that he hoped she had amnesia and that one day she would remember. But that never happened during his lifetime. Cindy was 20 years old when she went missing in 1981. She was 5 foot 4 inches tall, 115 pounds. She was wearing a white v-neck dress with pink pinstripes, cinnamon brown leg pantyhose, and beige open toe ankle strap sandals. Cindy is a white female, brown hair, brown eyes. She went by the name Cindy, typically. She had a chicken pox scar on her forehead and one and a half inch scar in the inside of her right knee. And it was shaped like an open fish hook. Cynthia Anderson has been missing for so many years. And there are obviously people out there that know something. If you have any information about what happened to Cindy, please contact the Toledo Police Department at 419. 419- Two four five three one five one. We would like to extend a thank you to the ever-talented Kyle Rebar for his audio work on today's episode. 
Just by listening to our content, you too are advocating for justice for these families. Thank you for making a difference in their lives as well. We want to share a few ways you can support us to continue our mission. You can become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $5 per month or a simple rate and review on your favorite podcast platform helps us get in front of someone who may know something. We will continue to shed a light on the forgotten victims, untangle the webs of deceit, and examine the eerie coincidences that make these cases so compelling. We believe that working together can affect change and create a world where victims are heard, justice is served, and communities are empowered to make a difference, no matter where or who they are.